Dead Space 3 was initially planned as a very different kind of game. Rather than the action-heavy shooter we ended up with, creative director Ben Wannert wanted something deeper, darker and deadlier than its predecessor Dead Space 2. He wanted to make a game about survival and with a real emphasis on what was his favourite aspect of the series, Isaac Clarke's internal struggle with reality. This was to be, at its heart, a story about psychosis. But as he told me during an interview this week, that vision was inevitably lost as part of a back and forth between the people actually making Dead Space 3 and those that would eventually need to sell it. As part of this bartering process, senior figures at Electronic Arts would encourage its development studio to move away from survival horror and towards something more action-oriented. They wanted online multiplayer and they wanted microtransactions. This really is a story about the difficulty of combining creativity with business. And it all starts, I think, with the first game in the series. You see, the original Dead Space, by survival horror standards, had sold pretty well. It's thought to have shifted around 1 million copies in 2008 and more than 2 million copies over the course of its lifetime. But by EA's own standards, this was considered pretty disappointing. As the president of EA labels, Frank Jabot, would say just a few years later, ultimately, you need to get the audience sizes of around 5 million to really continue to invest in an IP like Dead Space. Anything less than that, and it becomes quite difficult financially, given how expensive it is to make games and market them. This is the unfortunate reality that Ben Wannett found himself facing as he began work on the third game in the series. He wanted to take Dead Space back to its original horror roots and really explore the topic of dementia, but working at a company like EA on a project of this scale meant constantly justifying its value, constantly justifying how much money was being spent, and amongst other things, it meant regularly attending franchise reviews. And pretty early on, it was made clear to Wannett that EA wanted this to be first and foremost an action game, and on an executive level, the company just didn't feel like dementia was a particularly marketable theme, which meant less of this hey! and more of this. Get a weapon for everyone. And during this time period, EA was keen for pretty much every game in its portfolio to include some kind of multiplayer element, or more specifically, to include some kind of online multiplayer element. This was seen as adding a huge amount of value to a project and really increasing its chances of hitting that elusive 5 million mark. In fact, partway through the development of the first Dead Space game, it was decided that this too would benefit from the inclusion of co-op multiplayer. At this point in time, I'm told, most of the core game mechanics were already in place, so for about four months, the team battled with trying to shoehorn co-op into a title that had so far been designed with only single player in mind, and you can likely imagine how that turned out for them. The corridors were too small, the firepower of the two players was too great, and because you were zipping through these areas so quickly, the loading times between them felt even more frustrating. I mean, there's a debate to be had about how well survival horror can ever lend itself to co-op gameplay with both players chatting away over voice comms and probably ruining the atmosphere, but the feature ended up being scrapped for more logistical reasons than that. It was costing too much money, and because the team was focusing on this instead of just the campaign, there was a significant possibility that the release date would need to be pushed back, and so it was that Dead Space released with no multiplayer whatsoever. Now, the second game faced similar pressures internally. Once again, there was an eagerness for it to have some kind of multiplayer authoring. But having learnt a lesson from its predecessor, the team opted for an entirely separate competitive multiplayer rather than co-op. The hope being that it would prove less expensive than the alternative and that it wouldn't need to impact the design of the campaign in any way. Perhaps that didn't end up being the case, but as Wanna himself says, I personally don't believe it added a lot of value to the product. Even though it was fun to play as a diversion, I don't think it's why people would buy it. So when Dead Space 3 comes around and yet again the idea of multiplayer is brought up, the team says, you know what, okay, we'll do it, but we're going to do it properly. It's going to be co-op this time, and we're going to start development with this in mind. In fact, the idea they began with sounds really interesting. Right, so here's the pitch. Although the players wouldn't realise it to begin with, the co-op partner would actually be controlling a character called Shadow Isaac, a visual representation of Isaac Clarke's alter ego. They'd likely have a different name and appearance to begin with, and a big reveal was planned for the game's climax, but, and this is the really cool bit, I think, both players would occasionally be shown different things in-game, then the hope being that they discuss these discrepancies amongst themselves over voice comms, maybe even argue about what was and wasn't real, and eventually they'd come to realise that's the point the game's trying to make. Oh, I think that sounds really brill. You can experience that a few times in the current co-op version of Dead Space 3, says Wannert, but with that part of the game, we had so little time and money to build it, it was very difficult to craft anything interesting. And with the feeling EA being that dementia shouldn't be a big focus, Shadow Isaac was replaced with Sergeant John Carver, a character so integral to the storyline, he just sometimes disappears during cutscenes with no real explanation. Oh. 
This one's still alive. Bring him here. But what about me? <laughs> Wow. Uh, where am I, I though? What's gonna happen is you'll just be there and they'll never reference what happened to you. <laughs> oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> Finally, there's the crafting system. Now, in Dead Space 3, you can create new weapons or combine existing ones by using these workbenches, and you'll need to collect parts scattered throughout the world to achieve this. Now, the original idea was for Isaac to feel more like an engineer and for these parts to actually have weight and meaning to them, and the process of creating a weapon would involve actually using these materials in ways that made sense. Instead, that process was replaced with, I guess, what's more equivalent to a 3D printer than, than a workbench. And that's fine, I guess you lose a little bit of Isaac's character in the process, but you stop the crafting system from feeling too complex. That wasn't really the problem that people had with this part of the game. The problem was it featured microtransactions. Now, if you couldn't find enough parts as you played and you really wanted to make something, you had the option to just buy them instead, and this did not resonate well with the community. I asked one at what happened there, and here's his response. Microtransactions was a very delicate subject. It's always one of those things that's like, oh man, other people are doing it, and marketing says we can make X amount of money if we put it in, and at some point, somebody triggers it. The crafting system was never built to be a microtransaction system. That quote really sums up a lot of the problems that Dead Space 3 faced. The design process started with the team's original pitch, but it was very quickly diluted, if not entirely altered, by the needs and the wants of EA as a business. And as we said at the start of this video, creativity and business can make for really awkward bedfellows. If you played all three Dead Space games, you'll likely think of the third and probably final title in the series as being its weakest link. And after watching this video, I imagine you see that as a result of a meddling, money-grabbing publisher. I get that. But, you know, I think EA at this point in time just really wasn't equipped to fund, market and sell big-budget survival horror games. The way in which it typically approached its gaming franchises does not translate well to this genre. Had it allowed Wannett and his team to create the game they wanted to make, would that have ever reached the necessary audience of 5 million people? I don't... I don't know that it would, and so I understand the thought process behind wanting it to reach a wider player base that liked action games and soldier co-op friends, but man, it does feel like we missed out on a much, much more interesting game as a result. And there we are, that is the story behind the development of Dead Space 3. Hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't already left a comment explaining that you find it a bit annoying, the way in which I say the number 3, then please do go ahead, maybe even smash the like button whilst you're down there. Uh, this is a weekly show called Here's a Thing, in which we tell intriguing, hopefully, anecdotal stories about the way in which games come to be. We've done other episodes, you can find a couple of them here, and yeah, there's a new one every Thursday, so maybe come back next week and watch another, won't you? All right, cool. See you then. Goodbye.